Time is the corner of your life. It's the only coin you have. Be careful lest others spend it for you. Where I've impacted people in a positive way. And the book helps sort of get that conversation going. And that's why I wrote it. And I'm having so much fun just talking about this topic. Welcome to the Next Level Income Show, where it's our goal to take your income, your investments, and your life to the next level. I'm your host, Chris Larson. If you haven't yet, get a copy of our book for free at our website, nextlevelincome.com. That's www.nextlevelincome.com. Just click on the book link, and I'll even send you a copy if you put your address in. On today's show, we have Mike Kelly. Mike is an executive coach, consultant, financial planner, and a board director. He is managing partner of Right Path Enterprises, where he helps clients improve their ability to lead themselves and others. Mike is also founder and principal of Kelly Financial Planning, where he helps clients clarify their goals and make more informed life and financial decisions. Mike is also the author of the book, Leader Fluence, that we're going to talk about today, Secrets of Leadership Essential to Effectively Leading Yourself and Positively Influencing Others. Mike Kelly, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Chris. It's great to be with you. Yeah, I almost called you Michael, but we don't want to, you know, we, we can't tell the audience what we got into there before the show, but little, little inside, little inside joke. But uh, yeah, nobody, nobody really calls me Christopher anymore, except my, my grandmother. Um, and I think it's on the cover of my book. But other than that, uh, but we, but Mike Kelly on the cover of your book, which I'm, I'm excited to talk about uh, leader fluence today, Mike. Um, but before we do, I know you and I have had a chance to 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 meet in person. You have an amazing background. I'd love for you to share a little bit of that with the audience before we dive into uh, your new book. Thank you, Chris. And again, thanks for for having me. And thank you for the work you're doing to educate the public on really how to make that happen and how to impact the world through business and investing. And really taking the time to manage your own lives in, in addition to that. But I am a guy who grew up in South Carolina. Chiraw, yeah. South Carolina, the home of Dizzy Gillespie. As oh, wow. a yeah, the home of Dizzy Gillespie, that's what it's known for. A very small town. Yeah. But I grew up as a kid, poor parents, so uh, pulled out of school to pick cotton. But I won't get into all that. But anyway, first first person wow. to go to college in my family went to Mars Hill University, which your neck of the woods. Right I'm down in the Cincinnati road, yeah. at Mars Hill University, and it it really impacted my life in a significant way. Played basketball there ended up getting a degree in business. And thus, that led me on this journey uh, when it came to career. So I ended up working for a couple of big brands, Michelin, with Michelin for about 16 years. And I got experience in marketing, sales, finance, HR. And I also left them and I had a chance to work for Macy's. Big company as a vice president of learning and development, had a chance to build a department, pull together a team of people from around the country and had a great time there for about nine, 10 years. Then I left them because I saw opportunities to really help people in a more significant way. Mm -hmm. So to volunteer, got very involved with Rotary more so than I was at the time. But then I also started a couple of businesses, Kelly Financial Planning and Right Path Enterprises. My wife and I work together. We do coaching consulting. And with Kelly Financial Planning, I'm an hourly fee-only financial advisor. And my goal is to help deliver people into their dreams of freedom. Individuals, and organizations, and I love to do. And I and the reason I do this is because of what I saw as a corporate leader. A lot of people, they were working, but they'd quit and stayed on the payroll. They didn't know how to get wow. And now I get wow. to help those leaders. Wow. Um, there's uh, there's several things that, that I'd love to get into here, Mike. I think you know one of the things um, that I saw, I was wrapping up my MBA uh, 20 years ago, and I love I love the idea of of becoming a financial planner and helping people down that path. And one of the things that I discovered was a financial planner per se tends to be more of a salesperson, at least especially back then, twenty years ago. Um, can you share a little bit, Mike, about how that industry has changed and how what you do and your specific designation and and model is different? than your average kind of financial planner or broker that most people might be associated with? Yeah, the industry has changed, but in many ways it hasn't. It's still, mm -hmm. there's still a huge sales component, accumulating, yeah. getting assets, yeah. selling products, mm -hmm. those types of things. And that's part of what this industry is all about. And, and really, I think it gets down to what a client needs. If mm -hmm. that's what a client needs and you can do that and you can really do what's in the best of the client, perfectly fine. The yeah. way I do it a little bit different. There aren't as many people out here who do it the way I do it, but I do it this way because it allows me to be objective and do what's right for the client. I am an hourly or project-based fee-only financial advisor or financial planner. I don't sell product. 
I don't receive commissions from brokerage house mutual fund companies. I charge my clients an hourly rate or project-based rate for my services. Yeah. And that way, my motives are with my clients. I can be objective. I can tell my clients the truth. For example, if my clients wanted to use a creative investment, wanted to take money and put it in something like, well, I'm not worried about them taking money away from money I'm managing for them in order to do something that might, they might be passionate about. So we could talk that through how it looks with the overall plan. But that's what I do. And also, Chris, as part of that, we build life plans as part of this financial planning process. What is your okay. why when it comes to this money? Because as we know, money is an idea and it's something we should manage. It shouldn't, shouldn't be managing us as we find so often today. I love that. And yeah, so I think just, you know, kind of a, a quick overview, if you're listening and you're not sure about how the financial industry works, a, a lot of times or most times financial planners, they're compensated based on the assets under management, like how much how much your money, maybe they're paid a percentage of fee on that. They may even be paid um, a sales fee for some of their products, right, Mike? Um, right. And the fee only um, advisors that have, that have come in, like as you mentioned, have really changed the landscape in a way so that you can come in you can put together a plan that is is outside of, of that sales scope, or or maybe you have um, a lot of. And I think it's interesting. We call them alternatives, right? Like real estate, which is an alternative to you know stocks and bonds, and you know kind of what the traditional planning industry is, um, or even life insurance. You know, some of these strategies could be considered alternatives um, in some ways. But um, I think it's it's really it's really um, important. It's really um, interesting that you know we now have a whole nother category like you do, but Really, the life plan, Mike, I think, and and I'd love to hear your perspective on this. Money is a very emotional thing with people. It's tied, you know, I can, I remember um, my mom, you know, I would, I would save, I was always a saver. I'd take my dollar bills and my, any, any, and maybe $5 bills or whatever they were. And I'd stack them on top of my dresser, which at the time I would, you know, I, I feel like it was, it was above my head. I had to reach up there. It was probably, you know, like five feet high, four feet high. And I remember my mom would take them off the top and she'd put them in the bank. And I, that always kind of stung a little bit. Cause I'm like, where's my money? You know? And it was, it was put in the bank. And I always had this, you know, feeling that I wanted, I wanted the ability to control my money. I didn't want somebody to be able to take it away from me. And I know we all have these little things, you know, emotionally um, from our upbringing, like you were saying um, from, you know, the experiences that we've had, um, you know, whether, you know, whether you're, you're in a relationship and your partner controls the money. Um, what are some of the things that you've seen, Mike, why is it so important to start with your why and your life plan before saying, Hey, let's just divide your money up in these sorts of ways. What does that do for people? One of the things that it does, Chris, is it helps us recognize our conditioning. And you just talked about being a kid and stacking the $5 bills on one another, and your mom taking, we all have a money mindset. And that mindset didn't just happen. It has occurred over many years. And I call it conditioning. Yeah. We see the world a certain way. We think it's right. And many things about it might be right. But there are things about it that are wrong. And we need to change those things. I found that the way to do that is through getting clear purpose. And I get into this in my book. At the end of my life, when I look back over my life, what would I like to see? Yeah. And get a clear, why am I here? I often yes. use 100 years old. 100 years old, I'm looking back over my life. What do I want to see? How do I begin painting that picture right now? Well, that starts, you got that vision. You yeah. get clear on your purpose. Then what goals do I need to set in the important areas of life? And by that, I mean faith, family, fitness, finances, fun, firm, friends. When you set goals that matter to you, it's much easier to take the steps necessary to break the conditioning and also to avoid some of the things that tend to seek our our allegiance or I, to tempt us spending money on things we yeah. don't need don't yeah. appreciate and that doesn't hurt at all so in my opinion it's really goal setting and getting clear on your yeah. why because when you get clear on your why you're willing to make sacrifices and you're also willing to question what you need. i love that we were talking about that before the show and i think um you you said i i, I want if you if you can i'd love for you to repeat the quote um, and I'm paraphrasing, so please kind of correct me, Mike, but you, you made an amazing comment and I was like, wow, like we, we gotta, we gotta highlight that in the show. Um, you said something to effect, something to the effect of we're not teaching the next generation how to think, how to analyze. Um, is that, am I, am I saying that properly? Or, um, if you could kind of, kind of reshare what you said there. You're saying it correctly. We are in an economic society. Yeah. We certainly capitalism is a part 
part of our world and it's in, yeah. it's all disintegrated into everything. Yeah. The challenge we have in our country is that we're not teaching people principles that help you understand, navigate our yeah. world. Financial literacy, which I know you're very passionate about, is yeah. something that should be taught in every church, every school, every home. Very Amen. few of us understand it. And the other thing that's yeah. happening now as states start to make this part of the laws where they're, okay, we're going to yeah. teach financial literacy in school. But one of the challenges we have is that very few teachers understand it. So who's going to teach our students? Yeah. So it is just yeah. so important that we teach people how to think, not what to think. And that's one of the things I really loved about my time at Morris Hill University College at the time that I was there. But as I reflect back on that experience, they were really teaching me how to think, not what to think. And that mm -hmm. has helped me yeah. so much in my life and my career. I'm a guy with a growth mindset. I want to learn. I devour information. But I want to learn so that I can go out and apply it and help make the world a better place. At the end of the day, that's just, that's what this is all about. Yeah. How do we help someone else? Absolutely. And you know what? I, lo I love, I love your mindset, Mike. I love your energy. Um, I also love your experience, you know, you know, wh where you've come from um, South Carolina. They just, uh, I think this year instituted the financial literacy um, program in their schools, which, which I'm excited about. I love, I've been trying to track all the States, um, but you also mentioned playing basketball at Mars Hill. And, you know, I think one of the things that I learned from sports isn't only you know, the discipline and the goal setting and the planning and, you know, looking forward and the delayed gratification that, again, is seems to be something that that we lack a little bit in, in our society today as we can get everything at the tip of our fingers, whether it's food or, you know, um, a date like right. Like you can go online and get a date now, like on Tinder and all these things. It's wild. Um, but sports teaches you all these things, but also teaches you about leadership. Do you mind sharing a little bit about what you learned, Mike, during your time? You know, playing basketball and sports and how that translated into the business world? Yes, yes. Sports. Love sports. Love love basketball. The first thing I learned, and I think back on this, Morris Hill wasn't a basketball school. <laughs> so I learned how to lose. And I and we lost my last couple of years quite a few games. But yeah. I learned how to lose and not let that cause me to give up. Oh, so learn how to learn from things that did not go right. I learned how to learn from failure, right? Failure is not fatal. So that's one of the things I learned. And I also learned to take risk because of that, right? Yeah. You want to win. So you're going to, you got to, you can't do it, what you last game because it may not work. Someone scouted you. So you got to think creatively. You got to change. And coaches that I played for challenge us to do that. But I also learned how to relate to people. And one of the most important things, Chris, and, and my opinion when it comes to leadership is the ability to build relationships and relate to other people. And the other is, as a basketball player, it's easy to get your ego ahead of things and become all yeah. for become all about you. Yeah. I also learned that when you're humble, find that people are even more attracted to you and people want to help you out more. So those, those are two things, humility and leadership. Yeah. Certainly don't read your own press, press clippings <laughs> and build strong relationships with people. It's amazing what that does. In addition to the things you talked about, not giving up, you know, being persistent. Yeah. All those things are important, yeah. but people life is, in my opinion, is about people and it's about building strong relationships. And it also it's about getting to the point where people follow you because they want to, not because they have to. Oh, I love that. Um, and I'll yeah. share one other thing on this. Humility yes, please. Piece. Yeah. I've got a mentor friend in Cincinnati. He's in his nineties and he's wow. met yeah. many sitting presidents. He's travel around the world, but I've heard him say a couple of times that the leaders that he has met around the world, from around the world, including his own country, who were the most, who had the greatest impact, who were most quote unquote successful based on your definition of success, but most successful were leaders who had the characteristic of humility. They had wow. power and they could use it whenever they wanted to, but they didn't have to. People work for them because they wanted to. And he that. said that is something that stuck with him. And that was just something I, I heard him say, and I saw him model. I think that's awesome. Um, I mean, the humility, and I think I, I think back uh, to all the you know all the leaders that I worked with, and that's certainly something that uh, I admired. It was the people. Um, you know, the opposite would probably be arrogance, right? Especially uh, like ignorance and arrogance combined are are fatal in a lot of ways. But you had that other other wonderful quote that I said a couple of minutes ago: "Failure is not fatal." And I've been working with, with my boys here. They've uh, 
you know, they're play, they've been playing in the lacrosse league where they've been playing some harder teams, some older teams, some bigger teams. And we, we've had a chance to talk about that um, and just some different different circumstances. And I have this I have this belief that, you know, time is all time compounds like money. Yeah. And I think when we have the ability to, to fail early in life, we have a chance to take those failures and those really if we learn from them and allow that to compound and and go forward. And I think it ends up making life easier. Malcolm Elliott calls them uh, desirable difficulties yeah. where people that, um, you know, whether it's Richard Branson, who's dyslexic, um, you know, was able to overcome that and learn new skills, or he actually cites uh, individuals and in leadership roles, talks about a lot of presidents that lost a, uh, um, a parent early in life as I did and how that is something. And when I read that, I thought, wow, that's, you know, that's not, it's not, it's not a, it's hard to say it because it's not something you'd ever wish on somebody, but you know, if you're able to, to force um, yourself through those difficult times and learn from them, it is amazing uh, which you can come out the other side with. Yes, it, yes, it is. And and you've probably seen as a very, very uh, successful and a very knowledgeable investor, you've probably seen people who did not take steps because they feared failure. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, uh, it is, it is amazing. And you've seen the same thing as well, Mike, where, you know, the, the only thing worse than getting into or, or missing out on an investment, um, that goes up, the only thing worse is getting to investment that doesn't go well because investors, individuals want to say, Hey, I was successful. I got into this, you know, there it's, there's a little bit of shame in that, right. Especially if you're, if you're ignorant, I think that's what you do in terms of helping out your clients, um, keep that on track. And even look, even if you're working with a financial advisor that is, you know, more traditional, um, the, the data shows that those financial advisors more than compensate for their fee because they keep their clients on track. So they don't, they don't follow that failure and they don't follow the herd and say, Oh, this is, this isn't, you know, I gotta, I gotta do something else like the market's down or this or that. So it is amazing that, you know, if you can avoid those emotions, you can be successful in life. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I encourage my clients to use a telescope, a virtual telescope Ooh. more often than a microscope. I love that. I love that. Thinking long term. Yeah. And that gets back to having a vision and taking the steps necessary to move you forward. Invest Absolutely. investing is basically a series of steps and yeah. and then having somebody like yourself, a mentor, a coach, an advisor that can keep you on that track. Um I want to shift gears a little bit, Mike. Uh, when I started early in my career, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad when I was in my I think I was either 20 or I was in my early 20s for sure. Um but one of the things that Robert Kiyosaki said was that sales is a, is a great career to go into, to help your earnings. And he, he talked about how, um, you know, being able to generate revenue is, is one of the key, um, areas of business where you can really, you know, maximize your value. As I got older and more tenured in my career, you know, I started to, to pick up on some different things. And what I realized was you can't do it all yourself. It doesn't matter how good of a salesperson you are. And I had a, my mentor, um, in, in one of my, uh, businesses that I worked with or uh, companies I worked with pulled me aside and said, Hey, Chris, I'd love to have a hundred of you, but that's just not how it is. As a leader, you need to learn how to work with all different types of people. And what I came to find out was that sales is a very valuable skill set, but there's a skill set that's even more valuable. And that's leadership, the ability to take your knowledge, convey it to others and multiply the impact that you have either in a business sense or in the world. And that's that's why I wanted to have you on today, Mike, because your new book, Leader Fluence, um, and hopefully you can uh, whoop, got a little glare on there. Uh, here we go, Leader Fluence: um, Secrets of Leadership, essential to effectively leading yourself and positively influencing others. And um, we're going to share with the audience how everybody can get a copy of this at the end of the show. But Mike, share a little bit about what made you decide to write this book, and what uh, what the listeners are going to be able to learn in here. And I got some quotes in here that I've highlighted. That I'd love to talk to you about as well. well I wrote the book because I hit my hit the wall myself. So I hit a wall as a leader. Mm -hmm. I had all the accolades. I had the perks, all those things that came with leadership. But I was imploding. And this was during my time with Michelin in the 90s. I was getting great experience. I was getting the opportunity to travel. But I was I gained 30 pounds, mm -hmm. wasn't sleeping very well. Wasn't a great boss, even though people told me I was. Wasn't a great husband, but I was working. I was driving. I was working really hard, 12, 14 hours a day. 
And when I wasn't working, I was thinking about working. One day I was in my office to have headaches. And I thought, man, I, this is not good. So I took something for it. Well, it continued. Ultimately, I went to the doctor. The doctor gave me something for my headaches, something to help me sleep. But it just didn't work. Hmm. So finally, I went back and he said, look, this is the fourth time you visited me. We need to scan your head. So they did because uh, he thought maybe something was wrong there. But there was no no nothing in my head, no issues there. But he said, you're under stress and uh, you're headed towards depression. So you probably need to change your lifestyle. And I thought me, a college athlete, you know, I'm a strong guy. I was 30 pounds overweight, man. And, and that sort of got my attention. I think God got my attention in many ways. And I realized that I wasn't the only one. There are many people out there. There were many people out there during that time. There are many people out there today who were like Mike was at that point in time. So I wrote the book to help encourage others, especially those who have the responsibility for leading other people, to lead themselves well first. If we don't lead ourselves, we don't stand a chance of leading anyone else well because people know and what we are even before we open our mouths. So the looking in the mirror, getting clear on who I am, and it gets back to taking more of a strategic approach to life, purpose, vision, mission, setting goals in those important areas of life, and not only setting goals in those areas, what matters most to me when you think about faith, family, fitness, dances, fun, firm, friends, how would I rate those? Yeah. From priority standpoint, one to seven. Yeah. And if we're looking at my calendar, does it actually align uh, in many cases? Yeah. It so for yeah. me, it's really about taking more of a strategic approach to life so that at the end, when I look back, we don't have much time on this earth. I think it was Carl Sandburg who said, Time is the corner of your life. It's the only coin you have. Be careful lest others spend it for you. Yeah. When I look back over my life, my hope is I've lived a, a, a life where I've impacted people in a positive way. And the book helps sort of get that conversation going. And that's why I wrote it. And I'm having so much fun just talking about this topic because it's, it matters. And our leaders in a world today, we need leaders now more than ever in every segment absolutely. of society. Absolutely. But we need no, I couldn't, absolutely. I, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think it's really interesting. We have this, um, this kind of dichotomy and it's, if we take a step back and we see it, it's, it's interesting because in one sense, we talk about self care and oh, it's it's so good to you know take days off and you know mental health days and all this. And as, as Elon Musk takes over Twitter and he's like, hey, you, you can't just take take any days off you want for for mental health care. I th I think it is it's important, right? It's important to have that time. Um, but also, on the other side, people say, hey, it's selfish to do things for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yet we we see the importance of self care and health, right? Like actual health care, like taking care of yourself. And it's like the old adage, you know, when you're on a plane and the oxygen mask drop, you grab the oxygen mask and you put it on yourself first. And then even if I have my two young boys with me, I'm going to do that because then I can help them. If yeah. you are a leader, and that's what I love, Mike, you've, you've put together a guidebook for leaders that are in this role where they may be like, like you and I, where you're giving, giving, giving. And sometimes you have to step back set your own vision for the impact that you want to set, take care of yourself so that ultimately you can help others. Absolutely. And the thing that the other part of the story is after I got that, after I started to shift, became a certified executive coach, life coach, registered life planner, all these things. And I started to view life differently. My results multiplied dramatically, much more effective. And I did not work as hard, but I accomplished much more. And I was able to help Amazing. other people step back and think and reflect. And it impacted teens because people realize that, wow, if I'm OK, I think it was Philip Massinger. And I start my book with this quote. Yeah. He says, he that would govern others must first be master of himself. I, I like to add him or herself in there because it's sure. not just for men, it's for women as well. But yeah. we've got to work on ourselves first so that we can better serve people. An example of that would be some of the opportunities that you share with, with your clients and prospective clients and investors. If you aren't working on yourself, Chris, it'd be very difficult for you to be the guy you are and to act the people you're impacting across this country in the way that you are. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And I think, you know, as a parent as well, you know, we are, kids are smart, right? Children are smart. They see what their parents do. They hear what their parents say, but they see what their parents do. And what I've learned as a parent is you have to look in the mirror a lot and say, wait a minute, am I actually living? Am I doing the right things? Because, you know, kids will point out or they'll pick up. They're like, well, hey, you're not doing that. Why do I have to do that? Um, and 
I think we see that in our leaders as well. If our leaders aren't living the life or aren't don't have the work ethic that we're, we're imposing in that case on our teams, then our teams aren't going to buy into that. No. Yeah. So that's so important. Um, you know, you talked about vision, Mike, and you talked about the why, but you also jump in and one of your quotes in here from Napoleon Hill, I'm thinking grow rich is create a definite plan for carrying out your desire and begin at once, whether you are ready or not to put this plan into action. And I love that quote because um, Tony Robbins also has a great quote. He's like, yeah, you know, a vision is great, but it's massive action that takes change. Um, can you kind of shed some light on that and talk about, I mean, you go from the, your visualization and affirmations in here, but tell us how you help uh, others and how you kind of see about once you have that visualization, that why, when do you start translating that into action? You start translating that into action right away. So I use something called, uh, and I talk about this in the book, a, a goal planning system or a sheet. Yes. Well, you set a goal, a smart goal. Yes. But once you set that goal, the work done. You've got to think about, okay, what are some of the obstacles to me achieving this goal? Yeah. What are solutions to those obstacles? Yeah. Then you list out what are the steps that I need to take by when, and more importantly, Chris, who's going to hold me accountable for taking these steps? Oh, yeah. And you got to take a step. And when you take a step, it could be a scam time, depending upon the magnitude of the goal or the, the size of the goal. But that's okay. You may fail, but that's all right. You're going to learn from that failure and you're going to take the next step. You take those steps. But accountability is a big part of that process. And I talk about affirmations and visualization yeah. because if you could sort of see what you're after, that can motivate you to continue to take those steps, even when it gets tough. Yeah. So that that is action. We The other thing I'll share about taking action and also yeah. failure. I'm a guy who is the sum of my failures because of the action I took. Yeah. I learned from successes, but I learned even more from failures. So Absolutely. taking those steps and then once you maybe get off track, evaluate why, what happened, what do I need to do differently? Yeah. And continue to move forward. That's when you really grow. When things are all going well, I've found that I get complacent. Yeah. So I can find ways to stretch myself, put myself into something that I where I where I'm not comfortable or a yeah. situation where I'm not comfortable, and then learn to become comfortable. And then now it's time for the next peak. Yeah. And actually I had I had that quote as well underlined. Be willing to be uncomfortable. Be comfortable being uncomfortable. It may get tough, but it's a small price to pay for living a dream. And you say it right there in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing, Chris, too, I'll share, and I didn't do this well, and I still work, and this is one of the areas I'm continuing to work on, yeah. celebrating success. Yeah. yeah. So I'm an action guy. I like to take yeah. action. Yeah. I, and it's hard for me sometimes to slow down, stop, and reflect, and to just celebrate what has gone well. Yeah. But that's a very important part of this process as well, because when you do that, it makes it easier to step up on into some of these other things that are important. Oh, I think it's, it's so important. And it's, you know, uh, one of, uh, one of my coaches along the way said, life is an energy game. And that's what I love about, you know, you said the visualization, like keeping yourself on track, you know, having a, um, a, uh, you know, a great, a gratefulness practice in the morning, you know, thinking about those positive things, setting your mind, right. And, and changing that energy, even when things aren't going well. Um, and then rewarding yourself when they do. I love like whenever we, we buy a property, we do something. I, I celebrate with my family. We take a little trip, um, we bought a property in Charlotte. So I took them to the Charlotte Panthers game uh, to nice. celebrate, which was fun. And they get to, to um, do that. And uh, the flip side is I love, um, I love this. So uh, Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal came and he spoke to our real estate group uh, earlier this year and, or, or maybe last year as this, uh, as this podcast uh, is produced. And Shaq said something, he had a military father. I don't know. You may know that. I know a lot of people listening might know that, but he said that his father, when he'd come home from winning a tournament when he was younger, he would take his trophy the next morning and he'd, he'd basically put it in storage. And Shaq said that as he got older, he started winning his rings and his championships. He'd go out and celebrate. And the next morning, he'd take his trophy and he put it in there because what he said that taught him was that, yes, celebrate success and then get back to work. Yeah. So I think you can do both. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, you can. You can do yeah. both. And, you know, you enjoy the journey, too, when you're on the journey. That's one Absolutely. of the things I love about integrating all of life. Those yeah. seven Fs 
that Ron Jensen talks about, a guy out of California, you know, yeah. the faith that the finances fund from friends, but integrating all of life. Like you talked about your meditative or, or quiet time practice in the morning. Yeah. That's important. Yeah. So, so you and, and, you know, you think about that, your health, taking care of your health. It's so important. Managing your money well, your spiritual, taking time out for family, really working hard. But understanding that work is going to fuel some of those other things. Yeah. It is yeah. so important to take more of a, I think, a holistic approach. Think about life and leadership. Yeah, it's it's so important. Yeah, and I love that. And what um, you know, what what I found, and actually one of the reasons I have this this picture up behind me, um, this is a picture of of the Grand Canyon, one of one of the favorite places that uh, we camped when we were in there. But it was a journey. It was a two hundred twenty six mile journey in the Grand Canyon on, on a raft. And I was, uh, there was four rafts with uh, my friends that we were on together and it was a tough journey. I mean, there were days where we rode, you know, um, dozens of miles and it was over a hundred degrees and, you know, it's like you, you set up camp at the end of the day, you break it down, you're, you're rowing into a headwind, but we had a great time. And that journey is where, where we had, you know, a lot of fun. It wasn't really, when we finished the journey, we accomplished it, but, and I found this in other areas of my life, Mike, it was a little depressing when we finished, you know, we could kind of bask and say, oh man, that was a great trip. But what's interesting is we weren't talking about the accomplishment of doing the trip. We were talking about what we experienced on the journey. Yeah. It's powerful. So yeah. taking the time to be is, is something that is a way for me, it's something that I continue to think about yeah. and I continue to work on. Yeah. And no matter who I'm with, just be there and enjoy that because those moments, we don't get them back. Yeah, no, we don't. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm acutely aware of that. Um, and it's one of the things that motivates me every day. And Mike, uh, everything that we talked about today, it seems like you've been able to, to weave in and touch on in your book. Again, your book is Leader Fluence. Um, if you wouldn't mind, please share how our listeners can get a hold of you. They can learn more about your services, whether that's on the financial planning side, it's on uh, the coaching side, or if they just want to get a copy of your book, what's the best way to get a hold of you, Mike? Yes, you can go to, thank you again for that, Chris. You can go to, to rightpathenterprise.com. That's my website. And there is a leader fluence tab there where the book can be ordered. So if you just uh, Google leader fluence, it'll take you to that, but you can order the book there now shipped out to you. The book will be released on Amazon on January 10th. So the publisher will release it. We did an author's release a couple months ago. We'll do a publisher's release on January 10th. But now you can reach me and you can order the book through rightpathenterprise.com. I also have another website, Kelly Financial Planning, where you can find out more about what I do from a financial planning standpoint. And you can also link to the book there. And I'm on all the social media platforms. I'd love to connect uh, with anyone on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Yeah. I love it. Mike, I've known you for a couple of years now. I've been excited waiting for your book to come out so we could have you on the show. And I'm excited for my audience to see it. So again, check out Leader Fluence at Mike's website, rightpathenterprises.com. You can always also check it out on Amazon here after January 10th. And Mike, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your experience, and also what everybody can learn in your new book here on the show today. Chris, thank you again for having me. Keep making a difference. The world needs your gifts. Thank you, Mike. Hey, Chris here again. I hope you found this episode valuable. Now I have one more thing to give to you. We have a page for my coaching clients where you can get a free copy of my book, as well as much more from previous guests on the show. Just check out nextlevelincome.com slash coaching to get a free copy of my book, audio book, and much more. I'll send you a copy of my book and cover all the shipping costs as a thank you for listening to the podcast. Also, please like, share, and take just 90 seconds to give us a rating on Apple Podcasts.